Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Jim Grossman, Executive Director of the American Historical Association. The American Historical Association is the largest professional organization in the United States devoted to the study and promotion of history and historical thinking. Jim has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. Thank you, Jim, for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. As a history major, I was very surprised to find that in a recent survey, uh, students were dismissing history uh, as, a, as a major, as a topic of, of, of study. What is going on in this country where we're, where we're beginning to forget how valuable a historical perspective is. That's an excellent question because it's obviously something that's vexing us as well. Uh, we're seeing the number of history majors at certain types of institutions going down, but actually at other types of institutions going up. Uh, some of what you're seeing in the press is dead wrong uh, in terms of the trends because the data are often based upon uh, a bubble that took place in the 1960s and 70s. If you go back to 1950, actually the number of history majors is fairly holding steady and in the last couple of years may be beginning to decline. But you're right, it suggests that uh, for many people context doesn't matter, uh, that they don't understand why it is impossible to think about anything to understand anything without understanding the context in which it's taken place. And that's what historians do. Uh, the other thing is that, that's vexing to me, is that people seem to, or not, some people, uh, certain governors of certain states, uh, have classified history and other humanities as somehow useless. Uh, somehow, if you don't spend your time in college learning how to run a business, uh, learning the specifics of a job, it's less useful than becoming an educated person. And I think this is probably a big part of the problem, uh, a lack of a recognition that educated people uh, basically form the bedrock of our polity and our economy. Uh, history in particular, for example, uh, when you study history, you learn how change happens. And as you well know, as the leader of a corporation, uh, any leader spends most of their time trying to figure out how to make change and how to shape change. If they're not a very good leader, perhaps how to stop change from happening. But it's all about change. That's what's in, what institutions are, is how do you move from point A to point B in a way that makes a certain amount of sense. That's what we study. That's what history is, change over time. So the American Historical Association is trying to draw attention to the importance of historical thinking. Talk about how you accomplish your mission. Well, we accomplish our mission in many different ways. In part, we accomplish our mission by bringing historians together to work through some of the sorts of questions and problems that we're discussing. Uh, we accomplish our mission by advocating, whether it is the formal kind of advocacy in Washington, uh, in terms of legislation, in terms of uh, trying to help agencies understand what we do and why it's important. Uh, but a, a different kind of advocacy is becoming much more important, I think, in the United States, which is kind of a public advocacy, trying to help our colleagues as historians do a better job of explaining to their communities, uh, to anybody who will listen why history and historical thinking matters. So in fact, one of the things that we're doing right now is we have a substantial grant from a foundation uh, to help college and university history faculty articulate exactly what it is that a history major learns in ways that parents and employers can understand. Uh, because this issue of uselessness that you started the conversation with we have found that it's a problem in odd sorts of ways. When students and parents come to orientation, first day orientation, and they walk around these rooms where people are sitting, faculty are sitting at these tables uh, with little signs that say history, English, sociology. Uh, our members have actually said they've seen students walk towards the history table and their parent put their arm, hand on their shoulder and lead them away towards something more useful. And in part, that's our fault because we have not successfully articulated what a history major learns 
in ways that this parent can understand, uh, in ways that a student can explain to an employer. Uh, often history majors, when they go for their first job interview, and they're doing the right thing in a way, uh, they're trying to communicate to a prospective employer what they've learned. And they'll say, well, I did a senior thesis on this aspect of the French Revolution. And it was absolutely fascinating. And they, they convey their passion for it. And they try to think about the lessons that one can learn from studying the French Revolution that helps you figure out whatever it is they're applying for. But what they don't communicate to this employer is historical thinking. They don't explain to this employer how they understand how change happens. They don't understand, they don't communicate to this employer that what a historian does is empathize more than sympathize. That the job of a historian is to situate yourself in a time and in a place and understand how people figured out what was going on around them. Well, part of it isn't part of the, the issue is that we have a rather simplistic and, and one-dimensional approach to teaching history. We don't teach history uh, from different systems perspectives. Is, isn't there a shift that, that is required on mm -hmm. the part of teachers of history to create a, a, a richer environment that, um, that maps more toward how younger students think and learn and the interconnectedness, the hyperlinks that you get through the internet so that, so that the students can actually navigate their interests. Part of the problem is that in many cases though, the students and, in, and the faculty members uh, are thinking, especially at the high school level mm -hmm. where testing is everything. They teach history that way, but then what they do is both sides think that what the students are supposed to have learned is the content, is the facts. So oddly enough, we, we write history that way, we think about history that way, we teach history that way. But we're assessing the wrong stuff, even if we're teaching the right stuff. So how do we assess the right stuff, yet still have some sort of standard? Because if it's, if it's, if it's just idiosyncratic, which is how people like to learn. People like to learn in ways that follow their interests and, and their passions and so on and create these unusual connections. That, that's very difficult to assess. Well, this is, this is actually something the AHA is working on now. And when you ask what are, what's the, the function of what we do, uh, a lot of it is trying to figure out how to solve exactly the kind of problem you just described. So we have a grant right now where we're working with uh, faculty at 65 colleges and universities across the country, uh, most of them non-elite. And what we're trying to do is help each of them figure out how to articulate the outcomes that they want for the history major. Once you can articulate the outcome, then you can assess it. The problem has been that the assessment tools have generally come from the outside in part because college and university faculty have been uncomfortable with the idea of assessment, oh. uh, with the concept of assessment. Well, because they've tended to see assessment as something that uh, relates to teaching to the test. Okay. That assessment has been pitched at the post-secondary level to look like the kind of testing regime that we're seeing at the secondary level. You have to test your students to see whether they're learning what you say they're learning. It's very different if, you, if a faculty of a department within a particular institution can say, this is what we think history is, therefore this is what a history major should emerge from this institution with, and now that we've articulated it, we can come up with a way to assess it. So the assessment comes from inside the faculty rather than the assessment coming from some accrediting agency or other outside entity. And history really can sit at the at the hub of, all, of so many disciplines, economic history, yes. political history, uh, sociology, uh, and, and other disciplines, uh, art history. Um, you have a interconnectedness uh, here that could be extremely powerful uh, if there is a way that the relationship between our daily lives uh, even our business decisions, our political decisions, people who look at our politics today and say this is a unique moment in American history just haven't read American history. 
everything that you do is implicitly or explicitly an aspect of historical thinking. I once had a group of students uh, look at the newspaper and I said, circle every statement that is explicitly or implicitly historical. And they never made it past the fold. Every time you see in the newspaper a reference to something being the first, right. the best, the most recent, the oldest, if you think about how often those types of terms are used, you're constantly thinking historically. The internet being a, a, a completely unique experience, don't recognize the impact of the telephone and of, of, of broadcast uh, uh, More radio. More important, or, the impact of Gutenberg. The good, <laughs> I mean, this, right. is, this kind of shift has happened before. Not the same shift, but right. this kind of tectonic shift has happened before. And this, is, this applies to every discipline. There, there is absolutely nothing that you do. So if a student, that, that, that is not implicitly historical. So if a student is interested in science, then studying the history of science makes them a better scientist. Well, when Patton and, Ra and Rommel fought, they were both reading Napoleon and Caesar. Right. There is, it's, what, I'm, what I'm interested in in many ways is the ways in which uh, Levitt and Dubner in Freakonomics have convinced us, rightly so, that you're constantly doing things that involve economic thinking and that if you're more intentional about it, you can better understand what you do, even if you come out with conclusions completely different from theirs. History is the same way. Everything that happens, everything that we do has a historical component. But the problem is that often our historical thinking is implicit rather than explicit. It's not intentional. And people don't realize that that's what they're doing. So for example, uh, you would not imagine history to be essential to a pre-med. Why should a pre-med take a history class? Why not biology? Why not? What does a doctor do the first time you walk into that doctor's office? Every doctor, the first thing they do is they take a history. And the history that they take is going to depend upon what they think history is. If they think history, biography, is a set of names and dates and facts, they're going to ask you a particular set of questions. But if they think history is what you were just talking about before, if they think history is a way of understanding the past, a way of understanding, you use the word relationships, uh, a way of understanding how something is situated in time and place, they're going to ask you a completely different set of questions. So your medical history becomes something else. And if the treatment regimen is about dealing with symptoms as opposed to dealing with root causes exactly. or the holistic patient, the needs of a patient, then you might be prescribing uh, uh, drugs instead of uh, during an end of life phase, instead of asking the patient how they would like to live. And, and you might come up with a, a, a treatment regimen that is completely unsuited to the patient simply because you're not really understanding that person's history and where they're coming from. You might be sympathizing rather than empathizing. Right. Which histori a good or historian does not rather do. rather than either sympathizing right. or empathizing. And I, I'm, I'm leery of talking about the end point of that. For me, it's a question of the questions, not right. a question of the answers. And every discipline asks a set of questions that are different from the questions that other disciplines ask. And our argument is that historical questions play a much larger function in public culture, policy making, occupations than people realize. So is it time now for historians to become more uh, advocates uh, for their own discipline? Well, this is what we've been encouraging. This has been very much a part of our activity for the last few years. Uh, traditionally, the term advocacy is used among associations as something that happens in Washington. Right. Uh, people have an, an organization has an advocacy budget which involves a lobbyist, which involves the costs of spending this time trying to influence what legislators do. So is this grassroots advocacy? Is it's this grassroots advocacy. Students, parents, it's schools, everybody who's communities. Interested in, yes, everybody who's interested in history ought to be able to speak in a variety of local contexts about why it matters. So for example, when, the, when Spielberg's Lincoln came out, and I, I was fortunate enough to see a preview, 
I wrote a piece for our news magazine encouraging every historian to write a review, a critical piece, an op-ed, whatever, in their local newspaper or talk on local radio, because people would be thinking about history at least for a few hours uh, when they went to see that film. People are interested. Yeah. And what we need to do is to capitalize on that interest and then nudge the interest, to push it a little further, uh, to say, okay, uh, it's not a question of whether the details in that film were right or wrong. What are some of the big questions that Spielberg was asking? Uh, w what are the questions that Spielberg didn't ask? That's the way to use these sorts of public events to increase the awareness that it matters. And historians need to not just talk with other historians. They need to yes. talk with members of their communities, business leaders, political yes. leaders, others. Well, this takes you back to the project I was mentioning earlier. It's impossible for a history faculty to articulate the desired outcomes of a major effectively unless they've actually talked to employers and parents to find out what they think a history major learns or what they think a history major can contribute, not because we want to change the curriculum, but because we want to figure out how to articulate what we're teaching in ways that address the desires, the concerns that people have. So we, the AHA has developed a document uh, that we call a set of reference points for the outcome of a history major that the participating de history departments are then adapting to their own purposes. But we've shown this basic document to employers and said, what do you think? And they've looked at it and said, this is what a history major learns? I didn't know that. Uh, this one, one, uh, I'll leave the, one large multinational company that I will not name, uh, the woman looked at me and said, this looks like a job description at my company. Uh, another uh, HR executive at that same, uh, same conversation said, this is a cheat sheet for any interview. So part of it is also showing these kinds of documents to employers and uh, not only, quote, educating them, but listening to them. Because in some cases, what they also say when we show them these types of documents is, what's this? What does this mean? And we'll explain what it means, and they'll say, oh, that's really cool. Well, what we then need to do is revise the document in ways that make them easily understand what it is that we mean. An important contribution to U.S. education and to our civic society. Jim Grossman, thank you so much for describing the work of the American Historical Association, and thank you so much for your insight. And thank you for the invitation for a conversation with such a knowledgeable interviewer. I much appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you.